get by. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a peach if you find the same right now. I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here with InspiredInsider.com, interviewing top founders and entrepreneurs. We're here with Jonathan. He is co-founder or founder? Uh, founder, but partner. partner. Founder, but partner of Rocket Code. We're here at IRCE in Chicago. Jonathan, tell people a little bit about the company and who you guys serve. Yeah, absolutely. We are, uh, we're an e-commerce software and services company. Uh, I guess fancy way of saying agency uh, that does e-commerce exclusive work. Uh, we're based in Columbus, Ohio, uh, a team of a little over 20 people, a nice. um, little over two years old. Um, we work heavily on the Shopify platform, um, optimizely certified solutions partner, Shopify Plus partner as well. Um, our clients are uh, Chubby Shorts, Kalo, Silicon Rings, um, Rhone Apparel, nice. um, Particle, and the Internet of Things space, a bunch of, bunch of others. Um, but yeah, we've got a, basically an active client roster at any time of 15 to 20 15 to 20 brands and and uh, working to aggressively grow our team and our, and our yeah. business so Jonathan tell me your favorite client success story oh so uh, absolutely and um, so a lot of our it'll be sort of an certainly an anomaly of a success story okay. because a lot of our work is like heavy front-end UI UX actually on the shopping experience yeah. uh, so but, like their site looks like crap and the app yeah, and before so tell me the before and after this yeah, so um, so very much uh, a lot of before and after web UI and UX. The story I was going to get into actually is more, yeah, um, it's in the returns and exchanges space. Oh. So returns and exchanges pretty much anywhere on the web or physically kind of suck, right? So you've got a vulnerable customer at a at a crappy time where they're unhappy with a product or they need something different, they got to return it. And yeah. Most of the time you go online and you uh, download a PDF and you send it into their customer service team and hopefully you get an email back and all that sort of stuff. So we worked with Chubby's Shorts initially to kind of say, we need to rethink this kind of from the ground up. Um, and so we built an application that now lives at exchanges.chubbyshorts.com where you go and you uh, enter your, your order number, the email address you use to place the order, and the shipping zip, and if all three of those things match, we pull in all the line items from your order, wow. and then uh, in line you can uh, in line you can exchange for a different size, you can return for credit, uh, and then with that credit you can get a gift card, you can refund to your credit card, or you can actually go through an accessionized experience and shop the site and build your exchange order. Right. So for Chubby's, what that meant is uh, a, a huge lift in Net Promoter Score. Um, they were actually able to take three full-time employees off the CX team and repurpose them elsewhere in the organization. Wow. They love you after that. Oh, they love it. Um, they love it. It's, it's a real cost saver, right? Um, and keeps clients happier. And then it took, so in returns and exchanges, um, it, they were... How did you even think of doing that, though? Uh, so it just, you know, was kind of an area where it's a, it's a really crappy experience for a customer and a really crappy experience for a brand that only grows the bigger you get. So the more successful you are, you know, returns are always a part of the business. It just continues to suck. And Because I know that and people know that, but they don't think to create a solution yeah. for it. So how did that even come to your... Your brain to create that? Uh, yeah, I guess. I mean, generally speaking, um, a, a, an answer that I think a lot of people who come to work with us have heard before working with us is no, like not possible on Shopify or not possible here. Right. Uh, and we just kind of don't really think of things as not possible. We want to challenge convention and say kind of why not. Uh, and so we started there, um, iterated on it a little bit, and now we've got three or four brands live on it. We're processing 500 plus transactions a day, and across all four brands, they've saved multiple full-time employees, we're seeing the same results. So um, so working to productize that, but that was really kind of a neat opportunity, especially when you think of being a software company um, where we actually got to validate uh, a solution in market with real data, with a real brand that's growing um, and see results from them. And so um, so that's kind of the, the championing story of maybe the last yeah. 12 months for us. And it's been super exciting. It has opened our eyes to um, really just looking for more and more opportunities to solve really, really unsolved, ugly problems in e-commerce. What made you start Rocket Code. So it was a good story here. Yeah. So um, it's I had a background in um, enterprise software development. I was an information architect, business analyst, doing things like building intranet systems for Hilton Worldwide to manage the brand standards. You're an internet genius. That's what you're saying. Definitely sure. <laughs> no, um, but did that. 
um, really fell in love with e-commerce because it was closer to the dollar than, you know, we'd do a marketing site for a restaurant and we'd have to compare same store sales and try and show that we had some return on, try to show that we delivered some value for our work. And what I found with e-commerce was we could actually very definitively say, hey, look, if we, if we structure this right, if we come up with a hypothesis the right way and do the right things, we can say that we made this change and it had this impact and that made your business better in, in this way. So it was closer to the dollar. Um, but so I left, I left that agency to run digital strategy and e-commerce for a, a vintage inspired apparel brand in Columbus called Homage, um, homage.com. They, you know, sell big into sports and, and uh, pop culture and stuff like that. Um, but really, um, love those companies, uh, but had a lot of opinions about how I thought the business should be run and things I wanted to do. And kind of, um, when I launched Homage on Shopify Plus, we were the ninth brand to launch on Shopify Plus. Uh, I was super early in the early in the Shopify Plus days. Uh, knew a lot of the C-suite there, and kind of saw an opportunity to say, okay, you know. You saw it. Yeah, put up, like, put up or shut up. If you're unhappy with, if you want to run a business and you see this little niche of opportunity and, you know, can't help but not take it and wonder what if. So, uh, so basically uh, reached out to Shopify, asked them if they thought I should do it. Um, they said I should. Uh, long they story said short, we have tons of business yeah, for you. Yeah, long story short from there was uh, Chubby Short sent us a $6,000 check to kick off a project. I was still working nights and weekends. The day that check showed up, I walked into our president's yeah. office, quit my job, and Started doing Rocket Code full time. How hard was that transition? So, so the transition to starting it full time wasn't the hardest part. Uh, taking it from being a job to a business was the hardest part. So, 2014 was really a year of glorified freelancing, where I had two or three people and working in my kitchen counter, and everything was within my control. I love to hear those days. Yeah. So that felt really easy, right? It's like, oh, I can do this and make a bunch of money and all this sort of stuff. But uh, you know, growing a team from three to 15 and moving into an office and figuring out organizational structure and all that sort of stuff that the growth of the our first real year was uh was a challenge so we kind of say like 2014 was rocket code 1.0 2015 was 2.0 and we're now kind of 3.0 and really in the last quarter of last year found uh found our vision and, and hit our stride and kind of figured out who we are and what we were great at and, and who we wanted to work with and what we wanted to do so what's the different skill set it takes from going from that kitchen table three employees to than 20 people, because that's the transition for you, skill set wise, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, As a leader, founder. Yeah, uh, I think for us, uh, transparency has been huge. Uh, vulnerability has been huge. Um, yeah. Tell me, what do you mean by vulnerability? Uh, so talking, to, you know, telling our team when we don't know things and when we don't have the answers. Um, transparency, you know, we're fully transparent on financials. Um, we're, How did you come to that decision? That's a big decision to make too. I uh, wanted to do stuff differently, and and you know, I've been on the employee side and. I've kind of felt like, oh, like, what is this company really doing? Why am I here? What, you know, and when you, when you want to tell someone what you need them to do, sometimes starting with the why and explaining how it makes a difference for them and for the business and all that stuff can be really important. So, yeah. so yeah, um, that, and then, uh, realizing what you're really, really bad at and finding people to help. Build what do you, what are you bad at? <laughs> so I'm, I'm sort of the sales and the strategy and the visionary and, uh, you know, operations and finance are not my thing, and uh, we'd probably okay. fall apart without that. So my business partner does. So how does did you that. find that business partner that, that did operations? Because that's also yeah. a partnership, a marriage. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we are certainly married in some ways. Uh, no, we, we had known each other for six or seven years and uh, really kind of liked each other, worked in the same space, and always kind of wanted to find an opportunity uh, to do stuff together. So. Um, he does a lot of, he started in content and I started in commerce and we kind of see the convergence of the two being a really important thing go forward. So, um, so we kind of said, Hey, like we've been talking about it. Let's stop talking about it and let's, let's do it. Uh, and I'm happy to turn over the reins to things that I don't want to be doing. So he, he just runs with it. So generally, what's the biggest mistakes you, so you see people making on their site or in e-commerce in general? Cause you probably, they come to you and you need to kind of revamp things. Yeah. Um, the biggest mistake I think is really just in uh, there's this perception. It's not even like the specific work or, or something UI or UX related. It's like this idea that you need to reinvent your site or replatform or launch a new web design every couple of years. Um, and every time you do that, you're introducing some new and unfamiliar experience to your customers and you're relying on a lot of assumptions. Yeah. Um, and so what, what I kind of say is that we should, we should, you know, if someone hasn't been to your site in 12 or 24 months, it might feel and look really different. But for the customers that you have that are, you know, your lifetime customers and are going to be there frequently and, and back and forth and buying things often, um, that should change iteratively and you should always be kind of in, you know, a site is for me a living and breathing thing and you should be investing in it over time and um, challenging assumptions that you have or challenging the way that you've been doing things before um, and just kind of iteratively making things better and better. And that might mean that, you know, three years from now you've redesigned your site, um, but it, it didn't happen overnight and you didn't shock your customers. You do it slowly. Yep. Yeah, slowly, iteratively, um, very much. I mean, that's 
as much part of our methodology internally as it is in the recommendations we make to our clients. So who is your ideal customer? Uh, right now, um, brands uh, really invested in growth, um, in kind of changing the game and doing important things. Um, that kind of for us right now means if a brand's uh, maybe on the low end a $5 million brand and on the high end a $100 million brand, um, they're kind of what I would consider mid-market. Um, and they're maybe chugging along and doing really well, but um, but maybe even almost uh, maybe even almost in spite of themselves, um, or someone who has you know started small and put together sort of a band-aided and and you know I've I've been a patch things up yeah, type of thing. Patch things up. Started with something cheap. Had five or six different development partners. Have a bunch of different code bases. Um, not really know what's making their site perform well or not perform well. Um, and kind of wants to get scientific about taking an approach to growth and um, investing in you know investing in their. Uh, their properties on the web and, and how they, you know, not only looking at the customer experience, but how they can make their be experience better operationally, internally, um, for everyone that interfaces with their brand at any time. Um, that's that's kind of our ideal customer. Are there certain industries that do really well with Rocket Code? Uh, yep. I mean, apparel, fashion, retail, um, all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, I mean... You've proven some of those out already. Yeah, absolutely proven them out. And I, you know, I... I don't ever, I don't think, want to be an agency, or, and we don't want to be an agency that um, is kind of focused and says, hey, we do this one small thing really, really well. I think um, my, you know, and it's, maybe it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, but I kind of say that, you know, taking some experience from having an Internet of Things client and a watches client and a shorts client and a lingerie client, like their customers are all different, and we can see what is conventional and what works across all of them and what is the best practice and maybe what we what we thought might be a best practice or what we thought might be conventional that for some reason doesn't work in a, in a certain area and you know. What's the strangest client you've had? Uh, strangest client we have, we have a client who sells uh, arcade machines uh, oh, built cool. on Alienware laptops uh, <laughs> from, from like, you know, 500 bucks to ten thousand wow. dollars um and it's you know not strange in that it's really really weird but it's you know it's it's unusual to see how many people are buying them online um and it really starts to challenge some convention on driving average order value up and how you do that and um what you think should happen when you add a product to your cart and what interfaces they should see and what experiences they should have because um because it's such a high ticket item that conversion rates low but revenue per visitor is still really high yeah. and so you know you those two things don't always go hand in hand, and it's uh, it's kind of just really made us rethink a lot of the stuff that we thought was always always true in in the e-commerce world. So, John, are there certain softwares or platforms that you like to use or recommend to your clients? Uh, yeah, I mean, softwares, platforms. Um, we love Shopify Plus. Um, we love Optimizely. Um, we also look at and work with other platforms to keep ourselves sharp and make sure that um, you know make sure that. To, to debate well, right? To debate well, you need to know your side and and the other side, and you can't sit and talk about how some other platform's not well unless you really know that inside and out, and right. you can give an honest response. So, um, so we're always looking at other solutions. Um, maybe not specific tools and and platforms, but things like search and integrating a really great search experience is super yeah. important to us. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Definitely. I mean, Shopify Plus is where we were born. They're certainly the biggest partner in our business, the, play, the people that we're closest with and, uh, and have kind of been the biggest part of our growth yeah. to date. So proudest moment since starting Rocket Code? Uh, I mean, probably just today, every day, every, every week or every month for the last couple of months, it's just been, the organization's just been getting better and better. Um, and we're, re, you know, we've kind of reinvented ourselves and, and found some things that we love. And I think we've just got a great team and we continue to build a, a better team. And um, What do you do to build a, that team uh, and better team? Because it seems like that comes through as really important to you. Yeah. Um, I mean, our people are pretty much everything to me. I think um, I've always, I, I was fortunate to work at an agency a long time ago where um, I knew nothing about the space at all. And I was the 10th employee and they took a chance on me and I spent three years there and, um, you know, in three years they had accelerated my career to where I knew more than people who had spent five or 10 years in the space. Um, and I just looked for people that we can invest in in that way. And that doesn't mean that we don't hire people with pedigree, uh, but we want people that are always open-minded, are always willing to learn new things, are always willing to be challenged. And then we invest a lot in training internally and, you know, focusing on quality over profitability. And, yeah. um, you know, if we want, if someone on our team wants to do something the right way or the way that's going to get something done under budget, um, we'll take the right way all the time. So yeah. um, it's just kind of building some of those philosophies and literally sometimes putting them on the wall. Um, it sounds super cliche. Yeah, anymore. What what's on the wall at, at Rocket Co? Um, <laughs> so my... my 
core ethic probably is from the Latin word meliora, yeah. uh, means ever better. So basically every day I want to be better than we were the day before. Um, humility is also a big part of that. We check our egos at the door. You know, no one... Um, That's a tough one. Sometimes. It's it, it can be. <laughs> it can be. Um, we, so um, what else? Um, ev- um, insatiable curiosity. Um, we You know, we... Um, uh, like it's it's an Adidas thing, and we use a, der- a different derivative of it. But like impossible is nothing. We you know we I'm hard pressed to ever say that the the answer is no. Um, so yeah. we're always challenging invention, doing that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, those That's are those are some of So where should people go online to check it out? Yeah, um, RocketCode.io. Um, someday maybe we'll have a dot com. But but uh, Rocket- who owns that? Can we get it? We we have offered money for it. It's a squatter right now. Oh really? Uh, yeah, yeah. But. Uh, but we'll end up with it. Um, right. We'll get it. But rocketcode.io, um, you can check out our site. It's, it's, it's lean. We've also got a, a blog called ThinkShip on the Medium platform okay. uh, where we just kind of try cool. to share things that we that we know or that we learn or, or challenges that we've faced and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, uh, rocketcode.io and, and uh, check us out. Awesome. From IRC in Chicago. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other like a beach if you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand